Welcome to this presentation for Standard English Students on Module B, Close Study of Literature, and the prescribed text, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime by Mark Haddon. In this presentation, we will be exploring the rubric of Module B and some of the important elements to consider. And then we'll be looking at how Haddon plays with form and style in very particular ways. Now, Christopher Boone, the narrator of The Curious Incident, loves a good mystery, as he tells us. In a murder mystery novel, someone has to work out who the murderer is, and then catch them. If it is a good puzzle, you can sometimes work out the answer before the end of the book. In the opening chapters of the book, Christopher reveals the nature of this mystery. A dead dog, found impaled by a pitchfork on a suburban front lawn in the middle of the night. As Haddon's novel progresses, however, the reader recognises that this text is so much more than simply a whodunit, chiefly by delving into the mind of a teenager with some form of autism spectrum disorder. He is our narrator, and so as readers we are placed in an unconventional position to see this mystery from Christopher's perspective, and as such this has an impact on the text's form and style. The result is a highly original and inventive narrative that enables readers to piece together the puzzle of the mystery, but also the puzzle of Christopher and his world. Indeed, this notion of a puzzle is key to our understanding of the text. As Axel Cruz highlights, students do well with study of the curious incident if they see that it encourages them to become involved in a narrative and literary puzzle, like a game. So, as we play this game of exploration, not just into the murder mystery, not just into Christopher's mind, but also into this narrative and literary puzzle that Haddon plays with us as readers, we can better understand this text in more insightful ways. It is helpful to unpack a few aspects of the rubric to frame our approach to a study of this text. Module B, Close Study of Literature, requires students to explore the distinctive qualities of their prescribed text by paying close attention to particular characteristics. As a student approaching Curious Incident, you'll be pleased to know that these distinctive qualities of this text are quite apparent, and we will explore some of these shortly. The rubric also stipulates that students need to conduct an extensive exploration and interpretation, and thereby establish personal and intellectual connections with the text. So, in your study of this text, consider how you respond personally to its plot and style. Ask yourself questions about what this text reveals to you. A crucial part of this endeavour is the enjoyment of the text, which will ideally enable an informed personal interpretation of its significance and meaning. So, once again, the personal connection is important. It's interesting to note that the rubric highlights the appreciation of a substantial literary text. So tied together with a personal reading enjoyment is this investigation of the text with some deal of complexity. The module requires students to consider the text as a whole, as a piece of literature that has been written for the enjoyment of its readers, but also as a means to investigate sophisticated ideas. Curious Incident is notable for the fact that it bridges different reading markets. While it could also be seen as an example of young adult fiction, it's fundamentally a great example of a complex literary text in terms of its play with intertextuality, narrative voice, structure and metafiction. So let's start looking at form and style now, and a good means of entry into this is the discussion of this idea of metafiction, as it helps with an understanding of the text and what Haddon is trying to achieve here. Indeed, Peter Kunz refers to Curious Incident as an exemplary work of metafiction. An awareness of this concept of the meta should help you as a reader and a student to understand aspects of what Haddon is experimenting with in the text and ideally shed more light on its overarching aims. So the term meta essentially refers to a work that is self-referential, referring to itself or to the conventions of its genre. So if we take this further with metafiction, one definition is writing about imaginary characters and events in which the process of writing is discussed or described. So while Haddon is the author of the book, what we read is the book that Christopher, 
fictional character and narrator is writing. Often, we will read Christopher directly reflecting on the fact that he is writing a book, and what we are reading is his book. So, for example, he tells us that this is a murder mystery novel. Also, this will not be a funny book. I cannot tell jokes because I do not understand them. And at the end of the book, he writes, I was brave and I wrote a book and that means I can do anything. Now, genre is also crucial to an understanding of the text. And while the book is most obviously a murder mystery or detective fiction, it also delves into buildings Roman. As Kunz highlights, the book itself is shaped as a murder mystery novel that the young narrator is writing. Although it quickly transcends such genre classification to include elements of buildings Roman, both Christopher's age and sensibility go on to qualify him as a naive narrator, one who does not fully comprehend the ramifications of his or her observations. Now, Kunz goes on to highlight something of a parallel here with Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. It's very helpful to consider the idea of the novel as buildings Roman a genre that deals with the formative development of the main character, a child. And certainly we see this in how Christopher develops throughout the course of the novel. Like Scout Finch in Mockingbird, Christopher actually offers very perceptive observations of the world around him, despite his naive voice. Indeed, it could be argued that the observations of both characters are all the more powerful given the particular point of view that they each offer. It is this notion of the unreliable narrator which is important to understand in the study of Curious Incident. Christopher's autism means that while he possesses at times uncanny intelligence and perceptive insights into patterns, numbers and ideas of astronomy, his day-to-day -day interactions with other characters lack an understanding of social cues. He has no problem reading mathematical puzzles, but he finds it difficult to read people, as he tells us, I'm not interested in faces. And also, I do not like looking at people's faces. This is just one aspect of Christopher's personality that compromises his ability to offer accurate observations throughout the narrative. He is very much an unreliable narrator. However, this also works to the advantage of the text. According to Van Hart, purportedly the author of the novel, Christopher relates his story as precisely as it, as it unfolds. No sense of restraint shapes his narration. While Christopher's unfiltered lens can at times be shocking and uncomfortable to some readers, his essential honesty is endearing. In other words, the matter-of-fact way he recounts his conversations, abrupt, unfiltered, even complete with swearing at times, and the almost clinical transcription of conversations with terms like and he said and I said, it actually creates a great sense of comedy. It might be helpful then to consider that Christopher is almost like a court sonographer, methodically recording each word of the mystery of which he finds himself a part. While he lacks a comprehension of social subtleties, his focus on the small details and accurate recording of conversations actually helps him and the reader to solve the mystery, this puzzle of the dog in the night time. And as Van Hart continues, Christopher's inability to make inferences based on social context facilitates the novel's ironic twists. By applying the emotional inferences that Christopher fails to connect to the interactions he objectively describes, readers are able to solve the mystery Christopher invest is investigating before he does. <clears throat> Consider Haddon's playfulness with language here as you investigate Christopher's narrative voice. How does Haddon's play with varied sentence structure, for example, truncated sentences combined with extensive passages, help the reader to engage with Christopher's world? Look at the various tangents that Christopher takes, or his use of analogies to explain certain ideas. What do each of these contribute in terms of humour, insight, and an understanding into the mind of the narrator? In your response to the text, don't neglect the importance of Christopher's narrative voice. Yes, he is an unreliable narrator, but consider also the fact that he is very much a methodical detective, just like his literary hero, Sherlock Holmes. As Christopher tells us, I also like The Hound of the Baskervilles because I like Sherlock Holmes. 
And I think that if I were a proper detective, he is the kind of detective I would be. He is very intelligent and he solves a mystery. Of course, Curious Incident is a great example of detective fiction. And this idea of metafiction we explored before is critical here. Indeed, the title of Haddon's text comes from a Sherlock Holmes story, The Adventure of Silver Blaze. And here is a short clip. Is there any other point to which you wish to draw my attention, Mr. Holmes? To the curious incident of the dog in the night. But the dog did nothing in the night time. That is the curious incident. So intertextuality is a key concern here. For Axel Cruz, intertextuality fits into this idea of the text of being a literary game about genre and intertextuality. As a student of this text, it might be helpful to consider the ways in which genre and intertextuality are creatively explored. Think about the various elements of the detective fiction genre, aspects like solving a mystery, clues, red herrings, detective fiction, how does Haddon play with some of those elements in his own reimagining of the genre? Cruz also goes on to observe that The Curious Incident is a curious variation on, a conven on conventional textuality. It is not just words, it is also pictures, diagrams, lists and advanced mathematics exercises and games with the numbering of the chapter. And all of that is linked to Christopher's claim to be telling the simple truth when he has a limited understanding of the truth of human complexity. In your study of the text, consider these very interesting ways in which Christopher articulates his comprehension of the mystery, but also of the world around him. Of course, going back to the rubric, it is clear to see that these various Uh, graphics, illustrations, maps, footnotes and other breaks in the text serve as one of the novel's very clear distinctive qualities. You might like to think about then just how these more visual and graphic elements help Christopher, both as the author of his own novel, but also as a character within it, to solve the various mysteries of life that appear. But also go further to consider how these aspects might add to your own enjoyment and interpretation of the text. What does this contribute to your understanding of the text as a reader? How does Haddon's playfulness help the reader to develop some personal and intellectual connections to the text? So finally, when you come to respond to the text yourself, you might like to consider some of the elements we have explored and how these might enhance your overall understanding of the text. Think about metafiction narrative voice, language, genre, and graphic elements, and how they all contribute to quite a complex and engaging text that will hopefully stimulate some interesting ideas for you. As we finish, remember to consider fundamentally the enjoyment of the text. How have you responded to it as a reader, and what do you think this text has to say?